Hey guys, time for another fictionalhead.com quick tutorial. Uh, today I'm going to show you just a simple way to do uh, a more professional looking lighting setup in 3D Studio Max, uh, a real quick one. Um, a lot of times when people just dive into 3D, you know, you'll lighting is one of the biggest problems that'll cause a render to look unprofessional. Um, like in this instance, without any lights, it's pretty obvious that this looks terrible. Um, and if you just start throwing in like Omni lights or any light that spotlight that casts a real nasty shadow, it's still going to give kind of a flat, unrealistic look, even with shadows on. Um, it just doesn't look good. Um, and one of the first things I learned that helped kind of step it up a notch in terms of making my models and things look better when I rendered it was a way to just do a simple global illumination setup which is what we're going to do here. Um, the simplest way to do it is just to pop open your render dialog um, and if you have your renderer set to default scan line that's the one that comes with 3D Studio Max. Um, there's probably also mental ray for some people which I would prefer to use but for the bare bones basic version you can actually do it with the default scan line renderer just fine. Um, you pop open your render tab and go to advanced lighting and select light tracer. Uh, what light tracer does is it actually calculates ambient occlusion which will help your shadows look more realistic, more like uh, daylight. And then just make sure that you add from your uh, lights panel, add one skylight to the scene. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you put it, I usually uh, add it from the top view and then move it kind of off to the side and then go to your modifier tab and click into the color of the light and you can pick any color you want. I generally for a lot of my simple stuff would just use white. Um, and the reason you do have to change this is because it starts off as like a slightly hint of yellow as opposed to white. Um, and if you're trying to get like a white uh, floor to match up with a white background that slight yellow is going to throw it off. But once you've added that um, in your lighting panel here, these default settings will produce a render that will obviously take a lot longer, um, but we can see now that the, sh the shapes are causing more of this soft shadow on the ground and looks a lot more realistic than what we had before. Um, <clears throat> so at its core, that's the simplest way to do it. And what a couple of these settings are, uh, just so you know what they're doing, um, the global multiplier will take all of the lights in the scene and amp them up. Uh, one is default, one is normal. If you start going up higher, you'll see that when you render everything, it'll start getting more washed out. Like I turned it up so high, it almost obliterated all the shadows altogether. Um, generally, I don't use this. I just turn the lights themselves up, but that's up to you. Um, same thing here with skylights. This will affect only the skylights in the scene, like this one. Uh, rays per sample is how uh, kind of fine-tuned the effect is. If you leave it at 250, you might notice kind of like a soft blotchiness in the, sh in the shadows. Um, turning this up will make it cleaner, but it will also increase render time considerably. So, you know, walk the fine line. Usually, you know, 900 is about enough to make it look clean without taking too much time to render. Um, another way to smooth out the grain of the render like if I, I'll just do a test one here again. If we look at the shadows that are caused on the ground uh, and with compression you might not be able to see this but when you do your tests you will. There's kinda like a modeling almost to the gray to the shadows. Uh, a quick way to avoid that without having to increase the rays per sample is if you increase the filter size it'll actually spread out uh, the samples uh, so that the effect is more like a Gaussian blurred um, noise as opposed to a fine grain noise. So that really helps smooth it out without increasing render time too bad. Uh, ray bias is a lot, it's like ray trace bias with how the light bounces off things. Generally you don't need to mess with it. Um, if you start having objects causing shadows on themselves with like really finely bent objects then you might want to adjust it. Uh, and the cone angle is like the light coming down from above. 
um, just like you would think a cone would be if we had a cone in here, just to, as an example. Um, this angle here is how the light is going to come down. So the, the greater you increase your cone angle, um, you're going to get more of an effect like this. And if you decrease your cone angle, you're going to get your light coming down more like a spot like that. Uh, generally, again, <coughs> excuse me, you don't have to change it, but if you want to pull your shadows in tighter around your objects, you can increase your cone angle, or sorry, decrease your cone angle. And what that does is it focuses the light a little tighter around your object so that you don't get these kind of broader shadows. It pulls it down right underneath the object. Um, <coughs> the object multiplier is for your shapes, much to the same effect that the global mo modifier is. And color bleed is how much the light, uh, the, the material of your object is going to bleed into other objects when you um, render it. With it at one, it generally doesn't affect it much at all unless you have metallic objects and things like that. But if you have <coughs> it turned up higher, like you can't even really tell here because these aren't shiny. But the more you increase the color bleed, let's see if we can get it to do it a little bit more, obviously. The more you increase the color bleed, the more the shadows are going to soak up the colors of the objects that they are reflecting or shading. Um, and yeah, this is a bad example, but I won't go into it in too much detail. Basically, if you jack up the color bleed really high, <coughs> you're going to get um, the ground sucking up the color of whatever it is you uh, have on that ground plane. <coughs> the color filter is the kind of general tint to the light in the scene. <coughs> Excuse me. And the extra ambient is what it does with the ambient light in the shadows. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, generally, you want your shadows to be black in order to be realistic, but if you're doing some kind of scene where black doesn't make sense, you can adjust that here. Um, and the bounces is how many times the light is going to bounce off of your objects. At zero, the light just hits it and then casts the shadow and bounces also greatly increases your render time but if you turn up your bounces you'll notice that the render tends to get brighter <coughs> because the light is going to hit the object hit the ground and then go back it's going to bounce back so for every bounce that you increase with your <coughs> every bounce that you add it's going to brighten up your scene more because that light's going to keep jumping back and forth the way that real light reflects on and off objects so I just turn the bounces up to three, and you'll see that it really um, almost gets rid of the ground bounce or the ground shadow completely because it's jumping back and forth between these two so much. Uh, generally, I I would would leave it at zero when I would use light tracer, but one um, is also applicable. And volume generally you never have to move. That is kind of goes toward the richness of the shadow. Um, and then adaptive undersampling, this is actually how much uh, detail it's going to put per sample or how many samples it's going to use to generate your shadow. And if you check show samples, you can see um, the difference. Like this is 32 by 32 samples. You can see that it's placing more of a general um, set of samples to calculate the shadow. And then if we turn it down to one by one to really finely grain it, you can see that it's just going to load up that scene with samples. Um, <clears throat> this will also greatly increase render time, but it, would al it will also smooth out your shadows. So if you're looking for a really high quality kind of final render pass with these basic light tracer settings, you can increase your rays per sample and turn the amount of sample spacing down so that you get more samples and a higher ray count on those samples. Um, so, and this is going to look terrible because it's covered in samples, but <clears throat> those are the basic settings for Light Tracer. Um, and actually, one other thing I might as well add and throw in there. A lot of times when I would do this, I would include the uh, skylight, but I would also toss in just one Omni Light. But instead of leaving that Omni Light, 
um, at the intensity here of 1, which would be effectively 100%, I would turn it down to like a 0.3. Um, and if working in your scene is too dark when you do that, you can always right click down here to bring up your uh, viewport configuration. And then just go to rendering method and set the default lighting on. And that way your scene will always look as though it's lit from one single light source. But I would take that Omni light and give it ray trace shadows so that when I render it, you get the nice ambient occlusion uh, kind of soft shadow. But then you'll also get the one kind of specific light from where you want your light source to come from. And it'll also cast kind of just soft shadows, um, ray trace shadows in combination with that ambient shadow. And it's a, it's a very quick way to take your render from kind of blah to more professional. Um, not that this can be a substitute for modeling better, but just in terms of, you know, if you have a kind of a basic scene and it's looking lackluster because of lighting, throwing in ambient lighting and kind of a nice uh, set of soft shadows will help immeasurably. So that's the quick tip. Well, kind of quick. Uh, if you have any questions, just let me know in the comments or Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, whatever, and hope it was helpful. I'll let it finish here.